Okay, so what we want to do today is to talk about the initial elements of a test, of a statistical test. What does it actually entail? And we're going to go through this rather quickly. We are actually entering today chapter 7 in the book. So you should be reading up through chapter 7 and the book. And then after we finish this assignment 2, we'll start talking about when the midterm is and things like that. All right. So the idea of a test is to test whether a number is different from another number. You want to know if the number you have is important in some way and is it different from another number. That would tell you that it's sort of not important. So in the assignment that we're heading towards, we're going to have means for the congressional mobilization in an early period and we're going to test for whether the means for congressional mobilization for a later period are equal. Those two e those, so we're going to have two separate means and we're going to see if they're equal. So there are many ways to set up a test depending on what you're trying to test. So for right now we're going to talk generally about what a test actually is, what a statistical test is. And the statistical test information in the book can be found on page 144 and 145. Now this is general information for the statistical tests. So the basic elements of a statistical test are you have to have some information about the data themselves. So in the normal type of stuff that we do, you're assuming that the data were obtained through some randomization process and that they're normally distributed. And then you have a hypothesis. There's some other assumptions that are associated with it, but we won't go into them. The uh, things like the sample size, because it's really not so relevant for us because we're going to be always having enough sample size and we're always going to be testing it. The other thing is that when we deal with the tests that we're doing, we're going to be using the t-test, not the z-table. Remember, if you get a problem on the midterm, which gives you the population parameter, for example, if it tells you that the population standard deviation is such and such, or the population mean is such and such, that's information about the population. And which table would you use? You use the z-table. If, on the other hand, you're given the sample standard deviation and the sample or the sample standard error and the sample mean, what test would you use? You wouldn't use the Z because the Z can't vary depending on how many people you have in your sample. So for the samples, you use the T test. For information about the population, if you're looking at population and you have population parameters, then you use a Z. That's always the difference between the two. In practical terms, it means we almost never use a Z, but we almost always use the T test because we're always dealing with samples. And the difference between the Z and the T is that the Z is fixed, but the, <coughs> but the T gets fatter or skinnier depending on your sample size. Okay, now we're talking about hypotheses. Hypotheses, what are these hypotheses? Hypotheses always come in pairs, meaning there's always two. There's always a null hypothesis, which is what people were thinking before you got your great idea, before you got your magnum opus, before you said, hey, the world works the way I say it works. So before all that happened, there was a null hypothesis. Then we have an alternative hypothesis. Alternative hypotheses are different. Alternative hypotheses are your idea. You were saying, those old fogies had an earlier idea about how the world works and they were all messed up. My idea is correct. Okay, so the earlier people had their ideas and in their day, they were revolutionary ideas. 
and they overthrew the people who were before them. So who's ever got the basic paradigms that's set up now, they're establishing the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the thoughts, the conclusions, what people were thinking before you came around. In the absence of your information, the alternative hypothesis is your idea. And you're saying, this is the way the world works. This is my idea. And you really want to test whether there's enough evidence to suggest that your alternative hypothesis is correct. And with us, we should overthrow the old null hypothesis and say that your new hypothesis is correct. And then your alternate hypothesis would eventually become the new null hypothesis and people would be trying to modify your ideas. So it goes in a cycle like that. So if you're going to be revolutionaries, all statisticians have to be revolutionaries because you're all dealing with an alternative hypothesis that is yours. And you're all trying to establish that your alternative hypothesis is the correct one and the null hypothesis, which was what people were thinking before you came around, is the wrong one. You're trying to prove your alternate hypothesis is correct. So hypotheses always come in two, two types. Then we also have a statistic, meaning we have to have a formula for something that will tell us whether your alternate hypothesis or the null hypothesis is going to be accepted. So we have to have a test statistic. Now we have to have a p-value. The p-value is really interesting. And we're going to see that those p-values are actually printed out for us by R. And they're probability values. So the p-value is the probability that the test statistic equals the observed value or a value even more extreme in the direction predicted by the alternate hypothesis. Now, notice that the alternate hypothesis is noted by an H with a sub A. Hypothesis, H, alternate, sub A. So that's your idea. And it is calculated by presuming that the null hypothesis, and see that null hypothesis? H sub naught, or a little zero at the bottom. Everyone see that at the far right? H sub naught. So the p-value is calculated by presuming that H naught is true, and the p-value is denoted by p. Now a small p-value, such as 0.01, simply means that the data observed would have been unusual if H naught is true. So what you want is a small p-value. The smaller the p-value is, the more unusual that would be if in fact H naught was true. And if you have a very small p-value, you're ultimately leading in the direction of saying the p-value is small, thus the chance of H naught, the null hypothesis being correct, is really tiny, so might as well kick it out, reject it, and accept the alternative hypothesis, or the alternate hypothesis, which is my new idea. Okay, so the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence is against the null hypothesis, or H naught. Now, the the idea of a test is defined in the book in terms of all different types of criteria. So if you turn the page, you'll find on page 247 the five parts of significance for a mean. So in this case, your null hypothesis is and your alternate hypothesis is, uh, your, your null hypothesis is that the mean actually is equal to some, and here they write it as uh, mu sub naught, which is the mean is a particular value in the population mean. And what you want to be able to say is no, it's not that. Okay, you want to be able to say that your alternative hypothesis, H sub A, is different from that. Now, there are two types of tests that we could use. When we were looking at the null, when we were looking at the T test, as the T table as well as the Z table, we were always saying, well, for a 5% test, you have 2.5% on one side of the, of the curve and 2.5% on the other side. That's called a two-sided test, when you're actually using 2.5% on one side, 2.5% on the other. And that means that the number you're getting back is going to be either 
above the mean, or actually above this sort of null hypothesis, or below. Now, two-sided means that you're taking the possibility of that null hypothesis being correct. You're taking the possibility of that, of the result you're getting being, being accurate, if the null hypothesis is correct. You're taking that and splitting it up on two different wings. Okay? You're putting it off on two different sides. That's called a two-sided test. And what does that mean? That means that when you go into the test, you're not really caring whether the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis are in one direction or another. You just want to know if they're different. That means they could be different because your idea is less than the null hypothesis or your idea is greater than the null hypothesis. It could go in either direction. It could go to the left, it could go to the right. And so that's why they use a two-sided test. They just want to know, is it different? They don't care what direction it's different. It could be bigger, it could be smaller. They just want to know, is it different? So they have to test both sides. So the 5% that's cut off is half of it is on the right and half of it is on the left. That's different from a one-sided test. A one-sided test is saying, we're really just looking to see if my number is bigger. Bigger, bigger, bigger. It can't be smaller. Forget about smaller. Is it bigger than the number that it would be if it was the null hypothesis? Then you're saying, I don't need 5% split on either side. 2.5% on one side, 2.5% on the other side. What I'm going to do there is just say, put the whole 5%, put it, say, to the right. I want to know what's the probability of me being bigger than the null hypothesis, than, you know, given the statistic the way it is, if the null hypothesis was true. And you're sort of ignoring the possibility that the number could have gone in the other direction. That's a one-sided test. Now, the reality is that if you frame the question in a certain way, you can make it a one-sided test or a two-sided test. But statisticians, generally speaking, nearly all of the time, like to do two-sided tests. That, in essence, means that you're having 2.5% on one side and 2.5% on the other side. And if you're assuming that your dress would be bigger, Really, you're actually making the test more extreme because instead of giving yourself 5% on one side, you're giving yourself only 2.5% on one side. This will all become very clear when we give you an example. But I just want to bring up the idea that there is such a thing as a two-sided test and there is such a thing as a one-sided test. And there's no hard and fast rule as to whether you should use one or the other. But almost by convention, almost everybody uses two-sided tests. And all of the stuff you're going to get out of R for the whole course is going to be for two-sided tests. The only time to use a one-sided test, again, is if you're saying this number must be bigger than that number. It could never be smaller. Bigger. One direction, only one direction. Okay? And you're literally consciously framing the whole thing in terms of it can only go in one direction. This doesn't deal with statistics. This deals with your argument, concepts, okay? So there will be some times that there will be a question in the book, in the practice problems, for example, in the midterm, where they will phrase it in terms of a one-sided test. And the only way you'll be able to figure out is it a one-sided or two-sided is not by the math, not by the stats, but by the words in the question. Everyone okay with that? It's a conceptual thing. When in doubt, just use a two-sided test. You're safe. Two-sided tests are more rigorous than one-sided tests. Okay? It's got a more extreme example. It's got a more extreme value you have to have. So, because you're only dealing with 2.5% on one side. So you're starting to see that there's a little bit of <coughs> fudging in statistics. For example, where did we get this 95% idea in the first place? Where did we get this idea that's supposed to be that 1.96 as a golden number? for the z-table and for the t-table if you have a high enough sample size which doesn't have to be too high just get over 100 and you're almost and you're virtually there so where did this 1.96 giving you a 95 percent confidence interval come from where did that come from it didn't come from anybody in the heavens coming down and saying this is the one that's the number 95 percent so when they were studying for example whether mercury-laced vaccines were problematic with regard to autism. 
CDC used a 95% rule. And that was it. They said 95. Where did they come up with that number? It's basically convention. After people had used it for a while, they said, sounds good enough for me. It's honestly that. So they could have come up with the 98% or the 92 or 90%, but the 95% number was sort of the one that stuck as being the one the most commonly used. We're going to find out that we're going to be able to actually talk about the test, not just in terms of a particular cutoff value, such as 95%, but in terms of the p-value itself. And the p-value itself will say what the probability of getting this result is, if the null hypothesis was true, what that probability is exactly. You don't have to make it an arbitrary 5%. You'll, tell, you'll be able to know exactly what the probability of that thing is. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that the book does phrase, frame this, this type of test in terms of uh, the means and then alternately uh, other things as well difference between the means and so on. The difference between the one-sided test and the two-sided test is explained more thoroughly on page 153 of the book. Okay? And there is the talking about the one-sided test and the choice of one-sided versus two-sided. Again, when in doubt, just use a two-sided test. Almost all the time that's what you're going to be using in statistics. But conceptually, you should now have an idea of when that one-sided test might be a, a, a useful thing. Again, Agresti and Finley do talk about the idea of the, uh, the limitations of significance tests as compared with confidence intervals, and you can get that on page 163. I mentioned that a little bit in the previous talk. All right. Let's jump start right into what we're going to need for this next assignment. What we have is an on-year, off-year pattern of congressional mobilization. And it seems higher in the early years, and then after 1970, seems to drop down. So the on-year total seemed to have gone down, and the off-year total seemed to have gone down. They seem to have, meaning we looked at the plots, and we looked at the means, and you did assignment one, sort of looked good enough for you, didn't it? <laughs> it looked like they went down. Now we want to find out if they actually did go down. So what we want to do is we want to say, let's actually test that. Now, if we want to test it, we want to say, well, if we're going to be testing this thing, we have to have two different groups. Okay, well, we have two different groups. We have the on-year means for the early period and the on-year means for the later period, and we have the same thing for the off-year means, okay? So we have two different groups. Well, what else do we need for a test? Well, we need a null hypothesis, and we need an alternate hypothesis. Okay, let's think about this. A null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. What would the null hypothesis be? Well, you're trying to prove that the differences actually happened. So what would be the null hypothesis? That they didn't happen. So, if we have the means, and I'll just go here, mean 1 minus mean 2. Let's say, let's say it we're talking about the average for the on-year periods, for the earlier and the later periods. The on-year elections for the earlier and the later periods. This would be the, the mean for the, early, for the later period, for example, minus the mean for the earlier period. Uh, let me see, or the reverse, we could say which the larger, we can make it sort of a nice intuitive number so it becomes positive. Yeah, so we'll have the mean for the earlier period minus the mean for the later period, because this should be higher than this, and it'll give us a nice positive number, and it'll give us sort of, we could go either way, but it'll give us a nice feeling, intuitive feeling for it. So what's the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is that they weren't different. That means that the null hypothesis is that the difference between those guys is zero. All right? So that'll be the null hypothesis. What about the alternate hypothesis? So what we want to do here is call that the null hypothesis. And what we want to do here is find out what the alternate hypothesis is. So the alternate hypothesis is going to be 
that it doesn't equal zero. The subtraction between the two means is different. It doesn't equal zero. All right, so this so far we're okay. We have two means. I know how to calculate the means. I did it in the last assignment, okay? So I have one mean, I have another mean. I can calculate them, I can see what they are. I can subtract them. Okay, so I'm gonna find a number. I'm gonna take one mean minus the other number and I'm gonna get another number. Now what I need to do is to test whether that number is different from zero. How am I going to do that? Well, these things are measured in terms of proportions. How am I going to proportion of the congressional vote? I'm, I wish I had some type of standard, what, a standard error. What we need is a standard error. It doesn't matter what scale we're dealing with, as long as we have a standard error. If we have a standard error, we take whatever the distance is between those two numbers, this guy minus this guy is gonna give you a distance, it's gonna give you a number. Divide that number by some unit the unit of your choice, and you have how many standard errors it is. Do you get the idea? You're measuring the distance between these two numbers and standard errors. Hey, that's an idea, because I know what to do with that. I just look it up in the, in the for example, the Z table. I look at how many standard errors there is away from, you know, and, and I'll say, am I, do, I, am I, do I have more than 1.96 standard errors? Meaning, is the difference between this greater than 1.96 standard errors? If it's at least 1.96 standard errors away, that means that the difference between those two numbers is probable, that it's, you know, it's, it's probably different. Do you understand? At the 95% level. So this is really cool. So what we have here is, I have two numbers, and if I have a standard error, oh, okay, well, this is great. I have a standard, well, wait a second here. I've got a problem here. I've got a standard error. I've got a standard error for the first mu, and I've got a standard error for the second mu. But that's it, I need a standard error. What's the standard error for the difference? Because you see, my test statistic is now the difference between the means. Before I was just dealing with a mean and I knew it's standard error, but now I've got a test statistic that's different. It's like the difference between two means. So I have to have a standard error that's for that creature. You see how it's all sort of things get complex? Now, it's actually a very simple solution for that. Remember that issue that I've raised many times? The next course in statistics? Well, in your next course in statistics, you do this actually, for example, in math, 361 and 362, or when you take your graduate course in statistics, they will or should derive the standard error for a simple thing like this. It's a very simple thing, but there's a standard error for every test statistic, for everything you need, okay? And in this case, this is what it is, and it couldn't be easier. I'm gonna show you here the formula, and in fact, it is on page 185 of the book. And actually, I'm going to show you another print and another page for that formula in just a second. But for two estimates from independent samples that have been estimated, that have estimated standard errors of SE1 and SE2. So I have two standard errors. I have a standard error associated with the early period, and I have a standard error associated with the later period. Subtract the two, I mean, actually, you take the two standard errors, you square them. Remember the, the variance was originally what we were dealing with and we had to take the square root to get the standard deviation. So in this sense, we're going back to the variance concept. So you're taking the first standard error, squaring it, plus the second standard error, squaring it, adding them together, and then squaring the total bunch. Now I know this particular formula doesn't make intuitive sense, because I didn't derive it, but it sort of makes sense just by looking at it. You're taking, you have a formula for two standard errors and you're combining them, okay? You're square rooting the square of both standard errors added together and coming up with an estimated standard error, okay? And now look at the standard error for the sample, which was over here, for one, for the sample mean. 0.5. 
So it's a standard error. It's a standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So this standard error solution that we have for the estimated standard error sort of is making sense. Again, either if this was a graduate course, I would derive that for you right now. But at this level, I just want you to understand that there is a standard error for every new test statistic. And it's going to have a formula. And you're going to use that formula. And then you're going to say, with that standard error, what's the difference between the means? OK. By simply dividing the difference between the means by the number of standard errors. And then we're going to find out how many standard error differences there are between there. OK. The next page on page 187, I'm just pointing some things out that I'm not going to go into very much. It goes into the calculation of that exact thing using proportions. Because with the proportion, the standard error, the standard deviation is actually, the, standard, the formula for the standard deviation is different. It's pi times 1 minus pi. So you have this formulation for proportions. You're trying to find out if one proportion is different from another. Okay. Let's go down to the bottom here. This is what we're looking for down here, that Z number. You've got your estimate. And in general, this is going to be the test that we're going to be using throughout the whole course, variously phrased. We're going to have an estimate that we actually get, for some number that we actually get. And we're going to be saying that minus the null hypothesis number. So we're always going to have to have a number for the estimate, and we're always going to then have enough to have a number for the null hypothesis. We're going to subtract the two. So you're always going to end up with two hypotheses and two numbers. One, meaning your estimate that you got, and two, the number that it would have been for the null hypothesis. And you're going to always divide that difference by the standard error. So that's what we're dealing with. So here we have the difference between the two means, we're going to get a number. And we're going to be saying, is it different from the null hypothesis value? The null hypothesis value is zero, so we're going to be taking the difference between the two numbers, minus zero, which is simply the difference between the two numbers, and dividing it by the standard error. That's the general form of the difference when you have two proportions or two, two things you're calculating. Now this is the other page I said I was going to be showing you. And this is on page 192 of your book. And um, since it would be the same thing as we have, we have it here, uh, we have the estimate of the parameter minus the null hypothesis divided by the standard error. And that's the formula that we'll be using, which is on the right-hand side. Okay? Now, there's various other <coughs> situations that this could occur in. For example, you could have comparing means with dependent samples. And that goes on page 193. The one that I'm going to be talking about here is something that I actually do include in assignment number I do include this in assignment number two. And I sort of recommend that we don't use it. We don't often, that you don't often use it. But I do mention in assignment number two just to give you an idea of these alternate ways of phrasing these tests. There's no one solid Lockhart way of doing this. There's various ways of approaching it. Now this is a situation in which you're comparing means while you're assuming they have an equal standard deviation. That means you're assuming the standard deviation around this early period is going to be the same as the standard deviation around the later period. If you do that and you're assuming the same standard deviation for the same period, 
Well, and the other one, and the other formulation, you had a, a first, you had a, remember the standard deviations divided by the square root of n, so you're dealing with the standard error. Essentially, you're assuming it to be the same on both sides. You have a different formulation for that. And so the standard error is combined. Now, the only trouble with this is that you don't really know sometimes whether the standard error is going to be the same. So what you have to do, if you do approach this, you actually have to do a statistical test to see whether the standard errors are the same in the first place. So I sort of normally suggest that people simply don't go that way. That you go into statistical tests assuming the standard error is going to be different and simply do the statistical test. But occasionally you will find some people doing something where they assume the standard errors are different. I have seen very often in applied work where people assume the standard errors are different and they just use a different test, but they never test whether the standard deviations are different or th and that thus the standard errors are different. And you really can't do that. You, if you're going to assume something, you have to test something. If you're going to assume that one number equals another number, you have to test it. You just can't say it's equal in the first place. So if you're going to actually assume something, you actually have to do it. You just, you actually have to test it. You can avoid the whole problem by simply just assuming that they're not different. I mean, assuming that they are different, rather, and just running the test the way we first phrased it. Now, this will all make a lot of sense once we jump straight to assignment number two, and that's what I want to do right now. So let's look at assignment number two. This will give you the meat on the bones of everything we've talked about and it will make it all make sense. So for this assignment, you will again be analyzing the on-year and off-year pattern of political participation in voting during the U.S. congressional elections. Now keep focused on the idea that you have to use the normal English language to explain the statistics, so we want to write clearly. This is a writing intensive course, so that's crucial. In this case, you will conduct and evaluate t-tests to test for the difference between the means. You are to examine the differences in congressional mobilization using the early period. Now, notice that the year is different. Instead of starting in 1950, I'm now starting in 1932 and going up to 1970. So the same dividing point, but we're starting at an earlier time period. And this is a later period from 1972 to 1988. Now, I want you to think about these two periods. Why are the, these two periods useful? Especially, why do you want to begin in 1932 for the first period? Now, most of you have figured out why 1970 is the crucial dividing point. That's when the 26th Amendment took place. So, what we have is 1970 and earlier, you guys, you guys, and I always use guys generically, men and women, you guys couldn't vote. You could not vote. But during, that was during the Vietnam War days, and you had a very strong argument. If people were old enough to go over and kill people, they should be old enough to vote to whether they wanted to go over and kill people. So the argument for the 26th Amendment was very powerful. So when that passed in 1972, you had young people your age, 18 year old and older, voting. It was a very tumultuous period. The Vietnam War brought this country down to its knees. I mean, it just, it was, it was the worst possible disaster of a war you could imagine. And, you know, and in essence, it was the craziest rationale for going into a war in the first place. And it's really not in dispute. The historical underpinning for that, especially with the Gulf of the Gulf, uh, with regard to the, what spurred the impetus, which is the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was a fraud, and that's not in a historical dispute. That's not just me saying it. The Gulf of Tonkin incidents simply did not happen. And when Johnson went to Congress and said, we need to defend ourselves because we had things, attacks on our ships for two days. Well, the first day was a very small boat shooting small arms fire at a destroyer. I don't even think it knocked the paint off the thing. And then the second day, it simply didn't happen. The incident simply did not occur. And Johnson went to Congress and said, we've been attacked, a major attack for two days. It was a complete lie. And the question is not whether it was a lie, whether it was untrue. 
That is not in historical dispute. The only thing is whether Johnson knew it was a lie when he went to Congress and said we need the, the ability to defend ourselves. That's the only thing that's in historical dispute. Did he know it was a lie or was he just saying the stuff from the, you know, with regard to um, what his advisors were telling him? This has been a pattern throughout. Uh, whenever you have a major American inv intervention in some place, you have some incident. Remember the weapons of mass destruction that turned out to be <laughs> totally fictitious? Uh, you see these types of things happening quite often. So it really tore apart the entire nation. So during that time period, you not only had young people being able to vote, but you also had young people becoming very disillusioned, very disillusioned in the entire system. And it took families and split them apart. So the 1970 year was really crucial because from then earlier, the young people, the only means of participation they had was literally to have, say, 500,000 people, which did happen, march down Fifth Avenue, screaming at the top of their lungs, Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh. Maybe half of them thought it was a hiking trail in the Rocky Mountains, but they knew that they were protesting something, <coughs> that they were wanting to be politically involved. And starting in 1972, they could vote. And that changed things. Okay? So that was a big dividing point, the 26th Amendment. But why 1932? Why 1932? So I want you to think about that. Why is 1932 such a big thing? So in 19, after 1970, starting in 72, you had the denominator, because it was mobilization at the eligibles, swelling, but you did not have the numerator comparably swelling, the number of people voting. All right, the programs below are set up to analyze the total congressional mobilization but also look at the total con Republican congressional mobilization and total Democratic congressional mobilization, meaning you're to focus on total mobilization, but then just sort of see what happens with the Republicans and see what happens with the Democrats separately as well. But the big question is total mobilization, where, where you're dealing with M tot Kong, okay, that's the variable, and when you're dealing with that which is Republicans and Democrats added together. And we're using the same data set as for the, last it, for the last assignment. You have to modify the last assignment to include the t-test. So basically you're going to be using much of the same code that we had last time and just simply modifying it by adding the t-test stuff to it. Okay, now you're going to be handing in something. This is going to be something that we're going to be doing quite a bit of. You're going to be re-handing in your first assignment, meaning you're going to take your first assignment, you're going to fix it, whatever I said, Whatever corrections I may do, fix it. And then you're going to be adding a page discussing the tests that you just did. Is everyone okay? So you're not going to be starting from complete scratch. You're going to be starting with your first assignment and fixing that and then adding to it and then handing that whole thing in. So it'll be about one page longer. All right? So let's look at the R code that actually does this. You'll be doing the assignment in R. I do have the assignment also done in SAS down below. If any of you know SAS or just want to look at how it's done in SAS, it's just for your interest and for your reference. And immediately below we have the R script and it does some of the analysis to get you started. There's always something that it doesn't do that you have to do yourself. Now, it's initially set up assuming unequal variances between the time periods, but the, mod the modifications for equal variances is also indicated, so you can see how it would be done both ways. How would you know which test to use? And you need to finish the script to include the test for the off-year elections, meaning I do it for the on-year elections, and then you have to modify it, copy and paste, change a few things to make it good for the off-year elections. Now, <clears throat> to do that, you're going to be using a variable called on. On means that election was an on-year election. And it's one, it's the value of one if it was an on-year election. So for 1972, the value of the variable on is one. And for 1970, the value, which is an off-year, the value for the variable on is zero. So it's a one if it's an on-year, and a zero if it's an off-year. Now, it'll be very clear. You don't even have to take notes. You'll see it's in the code. So you'll be able to see how it's used. 
and you're to analyze these data using the t-test to determine if there really is a difference in congressional mobilization between the time periods. You want to compare the on-year results for the early period to the on-year results for the later period. And start thinking about why 1932 would be good. I will give you a hint. First of all, 1932 was a big deal in terms of the economy. Remember? What happened in the economy? What happened in 1929? We had what almost happened in 2008. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we had a complete meltdown of the economy, right? So the Great Depression was in full swing. But also something else had happened. What happened in 1920? Who could vote in 1920 who couldn't vote before that? Women, right? That was the passage of the right to vote for women. Now, you know, you could sort of say America was sort of late in the thing, but like the Swiss didn't change it till 1980. So <laughs> it's taken people sort of a while to sort of wrap their head around it. But 1920, women were allowed to vote. So what happened to the Democratic, I mean, let's start with the Republicans. What happened to the Republican vote mobilization in 1920? It was amazing. Times two. Literally, every man who could vote brought his wife. Times two. It was literally just times two all over the country. What happened to the Democrats? Like, what? What happened to the Democrats? Like, did something happen? What happened? If you were like an alien from space and looking at the Democrats, you never would have known that the Constitution was amended to allow women to vote. Nothing happened. To the hundredth decimal point, nothing happened. No, the women didn't turn out. They just didn't do it. You had to start thinking about that. But it took some years for the Democrats to sort of get their act together. And start thinking about why 1932 would have been an interesting time period to start this process. And why wouldn't we want to start it in 1920 when women were allowed to vote? Okay, why would we want to start it in 1932 instead of 1920? If they were, see in 1970 we said, from 1970 and earlier the younger kids were not allowed to vote. 1972 on they were. So we divided it by the time that they were legally allowed to vote. Why didn't we say the same thing for 1920 when the women were allowed to vote? Why did we say it's nicer to start at 1932 instead? Just think about what happened, okay? All right, now let's actually look at the data and the R code. And let's look at what we're dealing with. So the beginning of the R code should make sense to you. Looks like the same thing we had before. We don't need to spend a lot of time with it. My data, read table, US party. Hey, that sounds okay. It's going to get the data set. Names, finds out the names of the variables in the data set. My subset data, that's great. The only difference now is in addition to finding out, in addition to selecting out for my subset data, year and m toad kong, we're also selecting out the variable on. That's the only difference. So we're going to have three variables in my subset data, whereas in the past assignment we had only one, well, we had only two. This keeps only the three variables that we need. And then we have the summary of my subset data. We did that last time. It gives us the interquartile range, the median, things like that. Nice stuff. And we printed out my subset data. Always print it out. Make sure you actually get what, you're, what you think you're getting. Now let's work with just the years 1932 to 1970. Now, I'm going to use my on-year data. My 32 to 70 on-year data, again, Pick a nice name for the data set so that you remember what that is. Okay, don't just call it Tom or Susan. Pick something nice. So my 32 to 70 on-year data, I'll always remember that is, what that, what, it, what that is. It's the on-year data from 1932 to 1970. And to get it, I'm going to subset the data set that was my subset data, which I created just above. And I'm going to have year is greater than or equal to 1932 and year is less than or equal to 1970. So from the last assignment, I'm just changing the 1950 to a 1932, changing the early year. But then I'm also going to say and on if and only if it's equal to 1. That's a 2 equal sign. So not only does the year have to be between 32 and 70, but also, and the on-year variable has to equal one. That'll give me only the on-years, okay? Everyone okay with this line right here? 
print it, my 3270 data. Let's see if it looks right. All right. Now let's find the same thing for the 1930, 1972 through 1988 numbers. So I copied and pasted that and put it here, and then I changed the numbers, 72 to 88. And I changed the numbers in the middle for year, so it says 1972 to 1988. Everything else was the same. Okay, notice also what I normally do, and, and normally I do this, and it's good, good practice, after I have, say, something on the left, such as the name of the data set, I put a space before the less than and a space after the, the dash. So when you have the less than, dash, I put a space before that, those two, keys, those two things, and a space after that, just for neatness. Again, it's not needed, but just for neatness. Why is it, again, necessary? Sometimes, conceptually, because if I ever start dealing with variables that have negative signs in it, and I have a negative sign right next to that dash, I can get confused. So, R won't get confused, but I can get confused. So in general, put a space before the less than and after the dash. All right, now here is my t-test. These lines actually do the t-test. Here is the t-test between the earlier and the later periods for uh, the on-year elections, okay? Couldn't get more simple. R has a test literally ready to go. T period test. And you simply put the two variables in there. T dot test, a parenthesis, your first variable, comma, second variable, end parenthesis. Notice with each, since I did not use the attach command, for each variable I have the data set name in front of it with a dollar <coughs> sign. So it says, it tells me which data set it's coming from. You really can't get simpler than that. A t-test, now this assumes that the variances for the two periods are different. That's the standard way to do the test. Okay? Now, again, the book goes through a whole bunch of different ways to do t-tests under certain conditions. I just <coughs> wanted to show you two. The sort of standard way, assuming the variances are different, and then one other way which is, let's assume that, the, that there are equal variants across time period. So assume that the variations, that the means are different, but the variations around the means were the same. So we want to say the variances here and the variances there are the same. So how would I go about doing that? So if you were assuming equal variances across the time period, then you'd write it like this. You have the same t-test, t.test. Everyone see that? Parenthesis, the two variables separated by a comma, okay? But you want to do one extra thing. You have to have another comma at the end of that, and you write var dot equal equals true. You're simply telling R the variances are equal. Do the test under those circumstances, and you'll get a new test. Now, you could have also used an F test to see if the variances are really equal, to be safe. That's what I always do. It's amazing how many people don't do these things. It's amazing to see how many people simply say numbers and then walk away. In statistics, you can never, ever say a number and walk away. You have to test to see if that number is different from another number. So if you're assuming the variances are different, most people would simply let it be. If you're assuming that the variances are equal, most, simply, most people would simply, under those circumstances, simply let it be. It's not right. If you're assuming they're not equal, then you're okay. You don't need to do anything more. But if you're assuming they're equal, you're making a statement, you really need to test it. So many people don't test it, but you need to test it. Anyway, how do you actually test it if you wanted to test it? You couldn't be simpler. There's a test in R, var.test. You're simply testing the variances. Var.test, someone wrote it up, it's perfect. Parentheses, you list the two variables, end parentheses, and you're done. So you have not only a t-test assuming that the variances are equal, but a test to see if in fact they are equal. You couldn't get better. So if you do something where you're using one of the different methods than we're using here for <coughs> testing means, if you make any assumptions, trust me, it makes you look more professional if you test those assumptions. For example, I see all the time people saying, 
Assume this is from a normal distribution. I hear that so often in professional presentations. And then I look, did they test? There is a test to see if something is from a normal distribution. And they don't test it. They just assume something's from a normal distribution without, ma without making a test. I see that almost all the time. It shouldn't happen. That's why statisticians get paid, to tell you how to do these things and how to make these tests. So if you make any assumptions, test if those assumptions actually are correct. All right, so let's actually run it and see how this works. And then I want to talk to you about something that is one of the coolest things in statistics that you'll ever hear. It is really one of the best things. So I want to go through this relatively quickly. So could everybody crank it up? Now again, for me, I would normally cut and paste this into whatever text editor, to be quite honest. Nobody else that I know does this, but I often use Dreamweaver for my text editor just because I'm posting stuff on the web all the time. You're just going to take this and put it into your script window for our studio. Do that right now. If I was doing this just for the class, I'd put it into WordPad or something like that. But I am just going to take this and put it directly into R because I don't need to modify it. Okay, but you put it into R studio. Let's do that right now. Okay, now you're doing R Studio, and I want to put it into the 64-bit version of R. And there we go. So, starting from the top, we have the data set being read, the names of the data set. We have the summary, which is the median, the mean, the interquartile range, and things like that. And then we have our subset data, and I print it all out. It has a lot of years that I don't want, but I'll get rid of those. Now I have my subset data separated only to the 1932 to 1970 on-year data, and I check to make sure those are the on-years. Yep, those are the on-years for those that were presidential elections in all of those years. Good. Going good, and that's the m tote kong for that, and on is equal to 1. Perfect. Everything's looking great. So this is for the later period, all right. This is for the later period. Those are the on years for the later period. All right, that's very good. Now I want the two means for those two periods. See, I have two batches here. I want the means for this number, and I want the means for this number. And I want to see if they're different. So here's the output. So let me get the cursor out of the way here. So we have, it lists the data for the two data, for the two data sets. It lists the actual t-tests, the actual test statistic. And we actually, um, assuming the difference, uh, where actually the, the, the alternate hypothesis is that the true difference in the means is not equal to zero. That means that they are different. And it's using the 95% confidence interval. Isn't that nice? Remember I said how nice it is to have confidence intervals? We're going to see why right now. And then we have the sample estimates of the means, okay? And so here are the two means. We have this mean and we have that mean. So we want to find out is 0.54 different from 0.47. And look, we have a p-value. Look up here, this is the t-test. And that's the degrees of freedom, 12. And that's the p-value. P-value is 0 0.0009525. So let's interpret this. That means that the null hypothesis is that they're equal. The null hypothesis is that this 0.54 is equal to that 0.47. What is the probability or what's the chance of that being true, that the two means are equal, okay, given the difference between these two numbers? given the difference between 0.54 and 0.57. What's the chance that that could have been true? Okay, and the probability is 0 0.00095. Is that less than 95%? Yeah, it's a whole lot less than 95%. So that's what the test gives you. The test says they are statistically different. 
Now let's look what we get from the confidence interval. See, the test just gives you an up or down. That p-value is less than 0.05. As far as the statistical test is concerned, I'm done. They're different. But like all you know is they're different. I'd like to see <laughs> I'd like to see it. I mean, are they different by a lot or different by a little? I mean, is it close? I mean, what? And you can't tell that from the p-value. All you're told is that, the, that they're different. So this point 0009525 gives us a yes or no. But look what I get from the confidence interval. The confidence interval is the 95% confidence interval that the test is based on, but it actually gives us the lower number and the higher number. Okay, so it goes 1.96 standard errors below and 1.96 standard errors above. Did you get the idea? And what do we see here? It goes from 0.32 to 0.95, nine point, I'm point, 0 0.032 to 0.097. Well, by looking at the confidence interval, I can also say the lowest value for the 95% confidence interval is 0 0.032. That's not even close to zero. I mean, the difference between the two means, we're dealing with proportions to begin with, 0.54 and 0.47. So 0 0.03, that's a big number. It's not like 0 0.001, which is like really close to zero. That 0 0.03 is like big. So that confidence interval says, this difference is not only different from zero, but is like really far away from zero. I can be really quite confident. This is great, that's why I'm a confidence interval. Do you get the idea? So this tells us the same thing that we get from the, from the actual test, but it gives us uh, that touchy-feely sense of, hey, I'm really okay. This, let's say this number here was point, it's now, it is point zero three two. But let us say it was 0 0.00001, okay? Let us say it was really close to, to zero, 0 0.00001. I still would have had significance on the 95% test. The test would still have said, hey, okay, they're different. But when I looked at the confidence interval, I would have said, by a hair, it just barely missed it. Do you get the idea? But with the confidence interval the way it is, I'm saying, hey, that's not a hair's difference. That, God bless you. That's a big difference. So I'm saying, so you see, that's what you get with the confidence interval. Same basic information up or down as the statistical test, but it's a little bit more emphasis, impact with the confidence interval. Again, most of the course we're gonna be dealing with just the tests. But every once in a while for accents for your paper, if there's a point you want to make and the test is significant and the confidence interval is way far away from the null hypothesis, hey, tell it, say the story, make your point. Not only is this statistically significant, but by a long shot, look at that confidence interval. The null hypothesis number isn't even close to it. You get the idea? Good impact. All right, now. Let's look a little bit farther down here to what happens when we assume equal variances across the time period. Again, the R code was simple as could be. Couldn't be simpler. You got a T statistic, your degrees of freedom. Okay, and then your 95% confidence level. And then you have the two differences between the two means. And of course the differences between the two means, the two means are gonna be the same. Confidence interval varies a little bit. Statistical, the p-value varies a little bit. But then again, you also have to test for whether the variances really were the same. And here's the result for that. Let's get this a little lower, good. So you could also conduct an F-test to see if the variances are equal. The F-test is a different statistic, but it's very closely related to the T-test. It's the square of the T-test. So just, it's, it's, we, we're not gonna talk about the F-test now, but it's essentially very much like a T-test. It's just another test. 
And so the F test for the differences between the two, the two variances, you have the two variables. That's the F statistic, the T st I mean the F statistic. Okay, and it has degrees of freedom for both the numerator and the denominator. So it actually has two parts for the, has two types of degrees of freedom. And it gives a uh, confidence interval there and the sample variances, which is the ratio of the variances. And basically in this test, it's if the, if the two variances are the same, the ratio is gonna be equal to one. Okay, so uh, it's really trying to see. Now, if you can just look at this, you're trying to see the ratio of the two variances, one variance divided by another. If they're equal, it's gonna be, the variance will be one, right? So the ratio of the variance is actually three. Mm, so it doesn't really look like they're so great, right, they're so equal. Here's the confidence interval. One is in between those two numbers, 0.348 and 14.6, one is in the middle. So the confidence interval is actually surrounding the null hypothesis. Okay? So anyway, so what we have here is, uh, actually the way this is, is phrased, it's a little different. The alternate hypothesis is that the true ratio of the variances is not equal to one. So that's how they're, so it's the, the alternate hypothesis is that, you know, you're, you're different from one. You have a p-value of 0.2875, so the p-value told you right away, hey, you know, don't even go that way. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good idea. But also the confidence interval tells you that it's not even close, it's not even coarse to the edge. And then the ratio here. So if you're gonna assume something, make a test, be on the safe side. Be on the better safe side, which is Courtney Brown's advice, is to always be conservative and do the tests which gives you, which, which forces you to make as few assumptions as possible. This assignment is like one page added to your past assignment. Even one paragraph <laughs> added to your past assignment. So, you run this, make a couple modifications and hand it in on Thursday, okay? This is not something where you have to spend four hours on. <coughs> this is like a five minute type of a thing. Well. The writing won't be five minutes, even if it's a paragraph, make it a nice paragraph. I mean, when you send an email, you spend more than five minutes on a short email, right? You wanna make sure all the spelling is right, you're looking in the best of, all right, so do the same thing. What if I wanted to change this? It does the test for the on years. What if I wanna change it for the off years? You see this on? You wanna select out the off years. So you wanna change that on to equal Zero, not one. So you change that on equals one, on equals one, change it to on equals zero. But you have to do something else. You don't wanna to have to remember anything. You wanna make it printed out. So you wanna change this word on to off. You wanna make sure you change the labels of your variables. Otherwise, I have seen people say, I'll just change the on to equal zero instead of one. And I'll just remember that this is for the off years. It doesn't work. You don't remember anything. Five minutes later, you, you have the wrong numbers and you're comparing them to the wrong things. So, what you wanna do is to actually copy all of this stuff from, now let us work for the years 1932 to 1970 for the on-year data, copy from this point all the way down to the bottom. Copy it and paste it below, leaving this part here exactly the same and it's clone above, um, below that. And then the clone version in the part below, which is a copy of exactly this, change the on to off, change the on equals one to on equals zero, so that you'll first run it for the on year, and then it will run for the off year. It'll all run together. Does it make sense, everyone? Make sure you change all the labeling and you're gonna to have to do the t-test stuff as well. You're gonna to have to collect your data over here. Remember your, um, you're gonna to have to collect, you're gonna to have to change this my 3270 on year to 3270 off year. So you'd have to change those ons to offs and you're ready to rock.
Everyone okay? All right, let me tell you how we're gonna start Thursday. It's gonna be the coolest lesson you ever had. You wanna make sure you get it. It's hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing, it may sound like a dull, dry, statistical stuff. You won't believe some of the outrageous things that happen in the world when you understand how hypothesis testing is, is actually done. We're gonna be talking about the types of errors, type one error and type two errors. And under what conditions would you have those? And we're gonna be talking about the line in the sand that, that scientists often say. And that's the, 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 the line in the sand that is gonna be actual saying, this is the line that I'm gonna say and I'm gonna accept it if it passes that line and not accept it if it doesn't. And that's gonna be called the alpha, the alpha level for the test, okay? Then we're gonna be talking about the power of the test. And we're gonna be talking about how to actually notice if you have a type one error and what kind of type one error are we gonna be really worried about? And then you're gonna be seeing some of the crazy things that real life scientists who are some of you teaching courses in universities all over do. When you actually see how a scientific test is actually structured, you're gonna, when you actually absorb it and understand it, you're gonna see that all types of violations of a standard statistical test are being done by mainstream scientists all over the place that have big names and big professors. And that is not a fault. That is an opportunity. That's where you come in. Once you understand how a hypothesis test is actually phrased and how it's actually formed, you'll be able to see stuff that's being done wrong by some of your own professors, by mentors, by people that are being, you know, big, sci big names and scientists in major universities. That's not a problem. That's an opportunity because you're the young kid on the block that's coming up and you need somebody to battle. And as soon as you can see that the battle lines are clearly drawn, that you have a case and you are going to win, full energy to you. So next Thursday, we start out with the most exciting lecture in any course you'll ever see. How to understand how to overcome people who have authority over you and to beat them into the dirt. <laughs> See you then.